Well, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome everyone to today's hearing to review the U.S. Forest Service land management and its impact on the health of our national forests. Uh, the question of the health of our national forests is an important one for members of our subcommittee, a number of whom represent national forests in different regions of the country. Uh, as chairman of this subcommittee and a representative whose district includes the Allegheny National Forest, I have a keen appreciation for the value of our nation's national forests. The health of our national forests is an issue of vital importance for rural America. Not only are our national forests a source of immense natural beauty, but they provide us with natural resources, recreation opportunities, wildlife habitat, and service economic engines for our local communities. By promoting healthier forests, everyone wins. Healthier national forests are more sustainable for generations to come due to decreased risk of catastrophic fires and invasive species outbreaks. Rural economies will benefit, benefit economically from increased timber harvest. Now we can continue to support a diverse population of wildlife through active land management practices such as prescribed burns. Our national forests are not museums and never were intended to sit idle. I say frequently, but national forests are not national parks. This is why the U.S. Forest Service is housed in the U.S. Department of Agriculture rather than the Department of the Interior. Our national forests are meant to provide timber, oil, natural gas, wildlife habitat, recreation opportunities, and clean drinking water for rural communities across America. For today's hearing, we'll focus on a few specific areas of forest management. Now, I want to draw particular <coughs> excuse me, attention to the timber harvest occurring in our national forest system. Timber harvesting is an important means for achieving healthier national forests and is crucial to supporting rural economies. Yet the level of harvesting on most national forests is nowhere near the target each forest plan recommends. The Forest Service's timber harvest has dropped dramatically from a high of 12.7 billion board feet in 1987. Last year we harvested a mere 2.4 billion board feet, though that has increased slightly over the, over the last 10 years. Now, I am sure I speak for many in this room when I say I was pleased by USDA's announcement last month that it intended to increase the annual harvest to 3 million board feet off national forest land by 2014. However, for the sake of our forest health and the health of our rural economies, I believe that we, we can and must go beyond that figure. Now, I look forward to hearing about some of the tools the, the Forest Service is using to increase its timber harvest, like stewardship contracting. I'm also interested in learning about the steps the Forest Service is taking to simplify the process of harvesting timber. Another important factor affecting forest health is invasive species outbreaks. In recent years, we have seen numerous outbreaks of invasive species such as the pine bark beetle in the west, the emerald ash borer in Pennsylvania, and other areas in the eastern United States. Invasive species outbreaks are, uh, can't be avoided. However, we, we can be sure that our forests are managed in such a way that they're more resistant during outbreaks. We will also be certain that the remnants from the outbreaks do not become hazardous fuel. Catastrophic wildfires are a perfect example, example of what can happen when our forests are not managed well. Uh, the country witnessed a series of wildfires during the last decade that were the worst we've seen in more than 50 years. I'm concerned that the frequency and intensity of these fires is a result of forests that have not been adequately managed. In 1736, a famous Pennsylvanian said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Many people have heard Benjamin Franklin's maxim but are unaware of its origins. He was referring to the threat of fire in Philadelphia and the steps that could be taken to reduce fire-related risks. I believe his advice is no less sage today than it was 276 years ago. If we've taken steps to reduce the threat of wildfires and reduce the associated cost to the agency, but more work remains to be done. I'm going to be certain that our national forests are managed so that they are good neighbors with adjoining state and private forests and do not pose an unnecessary fire threat. Lastly, the Forest Service recently released its preferred alternative for its planning role. This subcommittee held a hearing to review the planning role last May, and I look forward to hearing how the changes will impact forest management practices. I want to welcome Chief Didwell and thank him for appearing before us today. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work extensively with Chief Tidwell and the Forest Service since I was elected, and I look forward to continue to collaborate to promote healthier national forests across America. I also look forward to hearing from our second panel witnesses today. We have a wide variety of stakeholders who will tell us what the Forest Service does well and what they should be doing better. 
I particularly want to welcome Mr. Gregory Hoover, who is testifying on our second panel this morning. Mr. Hoover is a constituent from the Penn State Agricultural Extension, who brings considerable experience in research in combating various invasive species, including the emerald ash borer, which has been a problem in Pennsylvania. And finally, I want to recognize, I know he's in the room, uh, Mr. Ross uh, uh, Gordy of the uh, of the Congressional Research Service, who's retiring this week after 29 years of service. Um, Ross has been a valuable resource on forestry matters for members and staff of this committee, including my own staff, and I wish him a very enjoyable retirement. And now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Holden, for his opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to uh, thank Chief Tidwell and our other witnesses and guests for coming today to discuss the U.S. Forest Service land management and the challenges and opportunities for achieving healthier national forests. This hearing presents an opportunity for members of this subcommittee to get reacquainted with the national framework for forest land management and to learn how we can best assist the agency in maintaining and improving the health of the 155 national forests and 20 grasslands in the national forest system. As we discuss reauthorization of the current farm bill under tight budgetary constraints and even tighter budgetary expectations, it is important to hear from those in and around our forest communities about which programs are working, or which are not, and what we can do better to promote both, healthy, promote both a healthy forest and a hardy economy. The Forest Service should always consider the multiple uses of our national forest land, including timber production, habitat preservation, natural resource management, and recreation, and ensure local economic development and environmental protections work in harmony instead of in competition with each other. We need to make, make sure the Forest Service and its partners work together to improve forest restoration and conservation while promoting a robust forest industry that supports local stakeholders and results in restored jobs and a vibrant rural economy. Only in partnership can we ensure the viability of our forest land and forest communities in the 21st century. I look forward to today's expert testimony and the opportunity to listen, learn, and question those on the forefront of this very important issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I thank the ranking member. Now, the chair would request that other members submit their opening statements for the record so the witnesses may begin their testimony to ensure there's ample time for questions. And I'd like to uh, welcome um, we have, uh, one witness, our first panel, uh, uh, Mr. Tom Tidwell, Chief of the Forest Service, United States Department of Agriculture. Chief Tidwell, please uh, begin when you're ready. Well, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, uh, once again, it's a privilege to be here today to discuss the challenges and the opportunities for achieving healthier national forests. I appreciate the support this subcommittee has shown the Forest Service in the past, and I look forward to working with you to help address this very important issue that we're facing on our national forests today. Our ability to sustain the national forests and provide all the benefits that the public wants and needs is increasingly at risk. The droughts that we're seeing, the invasive species, more development in the wildland urban interface, uncharacteristically severe wildfires, unprecedented outbreaks of insect and disease. All of these stresses and disturbances are affecting America's forests. The Forest Service recognizes that we need to increase the pace and scale of our restoration, our active management of our national forests to address these threats. These threats to the resiliency of our national forests and watersheds, to address the threats to the health and safety of America's forest dependent communities. We also recognize a need for a strong integrated wood products industry to provide the skills to do the restoration work and to be able to use the markets to reduce the cost to the taxpayer. There is between 65 and 82 million acres of our national forests that need some form of restoration and we are committed to increasing the number of acres treated by 20 percent over the next three years. This will not only increase forest health, but it will increase jobs by 20% and increase timber harvest to 3 billion board feet. Now, how are we going to get this done? Well, I have a, a series of opportunities I want to share with you. And the first one is to increase our collaboration with projects like the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program, which is proving to be a very effective model for increasing the amount of work that's being accomplished and increasing the number of jobs that are being created. We want to be able to demonstrate 
that we can restore more acres with our, our pilot authority for a more efficient integrated resource restoration budget structure. We're going to complete our wildland fire management strategy that will reduce wildland fire hazards to communities by thinning forests, helping private landowners to remove fuels and hazards on their property, and increasing the effectiveness of our suppression efforts. We're going to continue to implement our bark beetle strategy to deal with 18 million acres of dead and dying timber out west on our national forests by focusing our timber harvest in areas to protect the public and communities and slowing the spread where we can. We want to continue to work with Congress to make permanent our stewardship contracting authority, which has proven to be a very effective tool to increase the implementation of restoration work, timber harvest, and increase jobs. And we need to continue to explore ways to expand our markets for wood products through our work at our forest products lab and to continue to develop the science, the science on how we need to manage our forests to protect wildlife, to provide clean water, to provide the recreational settings that 100, 170 million people enjoy every year. And then of course, we're gonna move forward with implementing our new planning rule, which is gonna reduce the time, reduce cost to revising our plans to ensure that our forest plans address the need for restoration of our national forests. We're also working on improving the efficiency of our NEPA processes through our work with CEQ to reduce the time and cost of doing analysis, thus saving time and being able to implement the projects and put people back to work. The opportunities are here for us to increase the health of our national forests, and I look forward to working with Congress to implement these opportunities. Restoring our national forests to ensure that they provide the benefits the goods and services, the benefits of clean water, clean air, wildlife habitat, the recreational opportunities like hunting and fishing, the economic activity that employs hundreds of thousands of Americans. It's a good investment for America. Again, thank you for the opportunity to address the subcommittee, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Chief, for your testimony. Uh, the chair would like to remind members that they'll be recognized for questioning in order of seniority for members who are here at the start of the hearing. After that, members will be recognized in order of arrival, and I appreciate the members' understanding. So I now uh, rec recognize myself uh, for uh, five minutes. Uh, once again, Chief, thanks for your, for your leadership and your testimony. Um, I'm going to come right back to uh, the thing I led with in my opening statement, most national forests are not harvesting anywhere near how much their individual forest plans call for as a sustainable yield. And how specifically will the preferred planning rule encourage more harvesting on national forests? How far will that move us towards meeting those sustainable yield goals? Well, Mr. Chairman, our, with our new planning rule, as we move forward to revise our, um, our current plans, the, this planning rule will require that we have components that address the restoration needs on our national forests. So it'll be uh, required that every forest will address what needs to be done out there on those national forests to ensure that we're providing for healthy, uh, productive national forests. From that, um, that effort, by working with our publics, we're also are we required in this new plan to be able to establish what is going to be the expected timber harvest. I think this will be a better approach than what we did under the 82 rule, where we developed a, um, an assigned or uh, allowable cell quantity that basically set what a maximum amount of harvest could occur. But it never did um, predict what we would expect to be able to produce um, when we, we, we deal with all the multiple use and also with the, the budgets we can expect. So under this planning rule, we're going to have a much better um, estimation of the amount of, of uh, harvest that's going to occur, the amount of biomass that needs to be removed. And I think it will prove to be a better uh, pr approach, especially for industry to be able to, to make their investments around those numbers versus what we did with the 82 rule. Thank you. I, I remained... Um troubled by the Forest Service apparent reluctance, and I expressed my concern in our, our hearing uh, last May, to deal with the uh, viability standard. You know, this language in the existing role has been a, a magnet for litigation, and so my question is why hasn't the Forest Service acted to improve the 
the viability standard? Well, Mr. Chairman, um, you know, I share your concerns with uh, the problems we had with the 82 rule when it came to viability for, for two reasons. Our approach that we used in the 82 rule didn't work. Uh, the approach of using management indicator, indicator species is not science-based, and it did not um, it produce the, the results that we wanted to ensure uh, we had wildlife uh, diversity. With our new uh, uh, planning rule, we've taken an approach to focus on providing the, the ecological conditions, the habitat that species need to be able to, um, to, to thrive. And we believe by focusing on the habitat that we're going to satisfy um, the majority, you know, 85, 90 to maybe 95% for, for all the needs for um, wildlife diversity. In those few cases where we need to do something else, where there is scientific evidence that we need to do something else to ensure a species doesn't trend towards listing, then we will take some additional steps to deal with the viability of, of those species. And we want to use an approach that's science-based and will do a better job, first of all, to provide for, for wildlife and to ensure that we're doing what we can to um, prevent a species from being listed. In my district, uh, when, within the mobile use, the shale gas production obviously is, is, is one of, of viable use. And it's ramped up dramatically. Um, there's a strong chance that some level of production will be occurring in the national forest uh, since 93 percent of the mineral rights are privately owned uh, how have you given any thought to uh, forests like the allegheny how would this preferred planning role impact water withdrawals in areas such as the allegheny national forest um, uh, the, the the question was how it would affect water uh, the water withdrawal which is a kind of a, a key component for uh, for shale gas uh, uh, for the process of extracting shale gas. So there's a large water requirement. Well, with the new planning rule, it will be, will be required to address the access needs and to also be able to have a component that um, addresses, uh, you know, energy production. And so we'll be required to be able to look at what we need to do, like on a forest on the Allegheny, to ensure that we have the standards and guides in place that will allow the, um, the private interest to be able to access their, their private minerals. As far as for the water that, that's necessary, we're going to be focused on the, the, you know, the surface impacts to minimize those as much as we can. But as far as you know, the water, we'll work with the state, um, you know, through the state's requirements to you know to deal with subsurface water, or um, in a few cases where there's federally owned minerals, um, working with the BLM. But the focus for the Forest Service is going to be on managing that surface resource. Okay, thank you. And now recognize uh, Mr. Schrader for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, appreciate you having this hearing today. I think it's uh, extremely important. Uh, Sure, I think everybody's concerns about the health of our national forests, and I agree with your comment about them being national forests and not national parks, and so we have to look at a new paradigm. I'd suggest, and I'm really worried, Chief, that uh, uh, the management styles we've tried in the past, and despite all your best efforts and the agency's best efforts, that uh, given the uh, litigious society we live in, that uh, so far the we're not it's not working just not working so uh, well I wish you the best on uh, your your new approach and I'd like to see uh, the committee get your targets uh, for the new plan and how the plan's going to be implementing them and and hopefully some benchmarks as we hit those uh, going going forward uh, the biggest concern I guess I have along the lines of my opening remark here is that uh, we're not focusing on the health of the communities uh, that live and nest inside our national forests and that despite these strategies the the overstock is growing uh, and I guess I'd ask one basic question up front why is it that uh, most states and local communities actually are able to harvest at a greater level and still provide the uh, sustainable uh, uh, benefits you you describe with adverse species healthy streams and that sort of thing why are they harvesting at higher levels for their small acres in our national forests Mr. Congressman, I, I think one of the differences is that um, you know, our main mandate to manage the national forests under multiple use, where we need to um, 
to address all the different benefits that the public wants and needs off of these lands and then be able to to find that so you're that suggesting that the states and, and counties don't have that same uh, goal um, I think at least my uh, experience with um, with states and, and a few counties is that they're often under state law required to look at how to you know maximize more of the revenue to provide provide for state school trust, for instance. Well, that's so, not true in my state. Okay. Uh, I can tell you that much. And uh, I will tell you that both in our state forests and on our county forests, uh, we actually do a better job of harvesting timber while meeting all the same guidelines in terms of diverse multiple use that, uh, that you're talking about. How has our strategy worked uh, with regard to the bark beetle? How, how, how many less acres are being infested now as a result of the strategy that the National Forest Service has implemented? Well, the strategy, the bark beetle strategy has been focused on providing for public safety and community safety. And then in the f a few acres, areas where we can make a difference to slow the spread is where we've been focused. So uh, bark beetle spread is actually starting to decline, um, but it's uh, primarily in, in areas where we're just basically um, running out of uh, forested areas, at least mature forested areas where the bark beetles have actually um, you know, run through that area. We are having, you know, some limited success in places like the Black Hills. Uh, we're in the ponderosa pine type, where we um, are trying to, to quickly move to each of the new breakouts and outbreaks and be able to deal with that, that small area to be able to slow down. How about my neck of the woods, which is Oregon and Northern California? We're uh, using the same strategy there is to being able to, when we see a new outbreak, to be able to, to move quickly in there, to be able to take out the trees that are um, infested, to be able to s slow down that, that spread. So it's still spreading. Uh, that would indicate to me it's not working very well. Well, the uh, bark beetles are a native pest. And um, we've always had to deal with bark beetle infestations. So are we doing better with the emerald ash borer, uh, gypsy moth, and some of these others? Are they are we doing much better with them then? Well, we're uh, you know we're struggling with all the invasives, mm -hmm. and with um, emerald ash borer um, is is another you know significant uh, problem you know especially uh, here in the east. And it's one of the things that it's essential that we're able to maintain our research efforts to be able to try and find some type of a biological control uh, uh, for that um, that pest. So it doesn't sound, with all due respect, doesn't sound like we're being as successful perhaps as we'd like to be. And I hope that with the new rule and uh, new orientation that uh, we'll, we'll be doing a little bit better. You refer to the collaborative forest landscape restoration issues. Those are good initiatives. We have some of those in, in my home state of Oregon and really like them. How many are there, uh, if I may ask? Well, with the... Um with the, 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 the FY12 appropriations bill, we were able to receive full funding for that authority. And so we now have 20 uh, projects that have been identified, and we have three more that uh, we hope to bring on next year. So that's not a whole lot across the United States of America. It's hard for me to conceive we're going to get to even your you know, limited target increase of 3 billion board feet when we have only 20 some projects that you know really seem to be making a difference a new a new approach at least that you all are in a, going down how do you really think you're going to hit your targets with 20 projects well it, it's the collaborative forest landscape restoration projects are just part of uh, of our strategy to move forward but they will provide the model about how to look at much larger landscapes many of these projects are um, are these are at like looking at like a hundred thousand acres at a time that's where we can really make a difference to be able to use these projects as a model to be able to demonstrate the difference by looking at large landscapes with a commitment to provide the funding over multiple years it's going to um, i think encourage investment um, to be able to um, make sure that the mill owners and the loggers have the equipment that they need to be able to do the work and so we expect that by by through these demonstration areas that we hope that we can then encourage to be able to use this approach across much larger areas than we currently are. In Oregon, uh, where we're looking at different ways to manage uh, what have been known historically as our ONC lands, and maybe even turn them over to the National Forest Service, some of them anyway, for, for work and stewardship, uh, uh, while also providing a trust concept to manage some of the lands and see if we can't find that balance between preserving our old growth and making sure that uh, uh, the values in different 
parts of my state are respected. Uh, what, uh, there's been a discussion draft uh, uh, circle, uh, circulated mm -hmm. regarding uh, the strategy uh, and, and approach there. I uh, wonder if you've seen it and if you could uh, comment on that. Um, Congressman, I haven't, um, I haven't seen that discussion draft, but I'll look forward to having the opportunity to look at it and, um, and look forward to working with you to find this balance. It's one of the things we spend a lot of our time on is finding this, this balance of the different uses on every piece of our national forests. So well, those people that think setting them aside is uh, the answer, and we see that's not the case, I think, based on your testimony. And there are those that think that uh, thoughtful management uh, under uh, some of uh, uh, the state's Forest Practice Management Act and setting aside a certain amount of wilderness, but setting aside some certainty for our communities and our uh, employers that like to get uh, jobs created back in America is, is where we should be going. And I'll make sure you get that draft, sir. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I uh, thank the gentleman. Now recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Ribble, for uh, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chief Tidwell, thanks for being here. I also want to uh, express my personal appreciation for to you for attending a forestry conference that I, I hosted in Rhinelander, Wisconsin. And uh, it was uh, very beneficial for the, those folks that care about our forests in Wisconsin to have you there. And I very much appreciated your time. I want to just read a quote from your uh, from your. Um, uh, testimony and then just talk a little bit about that. Our collective ability to sustain the nation's forests and provide ecosystem services is increasingly at risk. Drought, invasive species, loss of open space, uncharacteristically severe wildfires, uncharacteristically severe outbreaks of insects and disease. All of these stresses and disturbances are affecting America's forests on an unprecedented scale. Well, it seems to me that all of these threats except drought could be improved by using the army of experts already available to the uh, to us in, that are provided by the U.S. timber industry, and it would be at no cost to the taxpayers um, simply by allowing and speeding up the process for them to harvest timber. All, I mean, if we if if we have a loss of open space, let's take some trees out. Uh, wildfires, as you're aware, are caused by a bunch of different sources, drought being one of them, but also two compact. Uh, of space invasive species and outbreaks of insects and diseases can happen when we have two uh, when when we have single types of trees growing in a single area and and all of these are improved by uh, a more robust management of the forest. Um, I, I would like to ask a question specific to my district at the Shawamiga National Forest. Uh, right now, um, the plan. Uh, that the Forest Service has is to allow roughly 130 million board feet per year to be harvested there, but we're only harvesting at 50 percent of that level. Um, I'm curious, this has been going on for a number of years, why, why does this continue to happen and what can we as Congress do to facilitate your agency to use the resources more efficiently so we can harvest more timber there? Well, Congressman, you know, once again, the uh, the, uh, cell, the allowable cell quantity is what um, was a requirement that we had in our 82 regulations that would just establish the, the maximum amount of harvest. The amount that is um, harvested each year is, is based on a combination of factors of the analysis that's completed about the work that needs to be done um, and then be able to get those decisions um, through and then to implement. On your forest, in the past, we've struggled a little bit with uh, the appeals and litigation. I'm pleased to know that our folks have now worked through you know, some of those issues and that some of our previous decisions that were um, held up now, we're going to be able to move forward with those. And so I, the, the way to, to move forward to be able to do more of the work that we need to do there is to um, continue to work with the communities to be able to um, reach agreement on the type of work that needs to be done and then to move forward and to be able to use that integrated wood products industry, those skilled um, folks that know how to do the work. We rely on them to be able to do this work. We also want to be able to um, look at much larger areas so to improve our NEPA efficiency so we're not spending as much time or as much of our finances, our funding on doing the analysis, but to be able to look at these large areas so that we can do one analysis that will cover you know, uh, tens of thousands of acres at one time and to be able to allow that amount of work to go forward over the next few years. We're also um, you know, looking at um, how we can be more efficient in our timber cell layout. 
to uh, do some things like uh, sample weight scaling or um, or description um, uh, by by prescription, so designation by prescription, instead of doing the uh, the level of marking that we've done in the past, so that we can be more efficient with um, our resources, so we can actually get more more work work done. But you're right, we rely on you know on the timber industry to be able to do the work that needs to be done in these national forests, and it's essential that we work together to be able to find ways to get more of these acres treated get uh, more of this biomass removed that needs to be removed and thus create more jobs and keep those mills uh, operating. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned NEPA. Uh, are there reforms that um, need to happen there to uh, uh, basically uh, lower timber sale costs and speed up the process? Are there things that we ought to be looking at on, on NEPA? Well, we are. We are looking at several things that, that NEPA allows us. And one of them is to look at using what we're calling an adaptive um, EIS. We're, um, we look at hundreds of thousands of acres at one time and to develop the analysis in the way that it not only will address the issues we need to deal with today, but also will allow us to move for the next, um, where we have an insect and disease outbreak or if we have a windstorm that comes through, to be able to move forward and do that work without any additional analysis. Um, the other thing that we're working very closely with uh, CEQ is how to do a better job to focus our analysis. We are um, definitely doing more analysis than we need to, and, and most of this has been driven by past court decisions. And I accept the knowledge that we have a tendency to, to take the last um, ruling and then apply it across the board, whether we probably need to or not. So we're doing a better job to take a step back and really doing the more of a focused NEPA just to address the issues that need to be addressed. And CEQ has been very helpful to provide some guidance and um, on this to help our folks have a little more confidence. The challenge that our employees have is that they know if we do this outstanding level of NEPA analysis, we can get the decision implemented. For them to take a chance to do a little bit less, it's not just that that project's not going to go forward. It's also that the jobs are not going to be created. There's an opportunity, a potential for another mill to close. So it puts a lot of pressure on our folks to make sure that as they move forward that they can implement this and be successful because that's what we're focused on is getting the work done, not just completing the analysis, not just um, making a decision. We want to be able to implement that decision. So our work with CEQ is going to help build more confidence about how we can do this to be more effective, more efficient, and really be able to um, re reduce the amount of time we're spending um, doing our analysis but at the same time, to be able to, to address the issues, provide for the protections for the environment that the public wants, but at the same time, improve the health of our na national forests. Okay. Th thank you very much, Chief. Again, thank you for being here, Mr. Chairman. Sorry I went over time. If there's a little chance to circle back, I'd appreciate that again. And I yield. Uh, thanks, gentlemen. Now, recognize, my pleasure to recognize Mr. Sablon for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and, and good morning, uh, Mr. Tidwell, Chief. Uh, welcome. Um, earlier, you were discussing earlier in your testimony about the that the 82 viability rule didn't work, um, and you said the new rule will focus on having what? How exactly is the new rule adjusted to make work what didn't work in the 82 rule? Well, the 82 rule, we relied on what's called management indicator species. We relied on being able to track the population of an individual species that would then indicate that we're providing for the diversity of wildlife in the whole. And the science has borne out that that, that approach doesn't work. Um, so what we're doing um, with the new planning rule is to take the approach to focus on providing ecological conditions, the habitat, uh, needs of species to be able to provide for by far the majority of the species. And then when we have situations where there's scientific evidence that there's a species at risk, then we are required to take some additional steps to ensure we're doing what we can to, uh, to provide that additional habitat requirements to ensure we're doing what we can to prevent listing. This is a better um, ecological approach uh, that in our view will do a better job to provide for um, diversity and where we need to to address the uh, viability of specific species. 
And, and, and thank you. And, and I um, join um, my colleague from Oregon in encouraging him to, you know, hoping that um, I'm mean, looking forward to the new rule working. Um, in the second panel, uh, one of the witnesses says the cost of force uh, service for NEPA compliance at over 300 million, 356 million exactly. Uh, or is the Forest Service a source of this estimate? Um, could you please uh, restate the question? I'm sorry. I One of the, uh, the second panel, there will be a witness. Uh, Mr. Watkins sets the cost of the Forest Service for NEPA compliance at $356 million. Um, is the Forest Service the source of this estimate? And if so, how was it determined? How they come up with 356 million because I'm leading to a second question. Well, that's uh, that's the cost of um, for doing all the uh, the NEPA analysis that we that we do that um, deals with um, timber rest or uh, forest restoration, timber harvest, but then along with every everything else that we do, we do about 3,600 um, analysis um, each year in the Forest Service and so some of the things that I've laid out about how to do a better job to focus uh, doing the only the analysis that we need to do to be looking at these much larger landscapes to be able to address all the restoration needs through one decision those are going to increase the efficiency and and it's my expectation that we'll be able to reduce the cost of, of doing that analysis. So the $356 million is saying fairly accurate number. It, it is. And it comes from your... your. Yes. But you're saying, then you said that, um, so are you saying would the adaptive EAS that you referred to earlier reduce NEPA compliance? It, will, it won't reduce NEPA compliance. It'll just allow us to be able to do a better job to, to meet NEPA compliance. Um, and so it's it's not uh, it's just so that we'll be more efficient to be able to do the analysis that needs to be done, and not to do uh, ad additional analysis that really isn't necessary to address the issues that have been raised uh, through the public involvement process. Yeah, and and you know, thank you, um, Mr. Chidwo. Um, I come from the islands, so you know, we had we don't have force. We're not one of the 42 states. Uh, I'm from Puerto Rico, and I can understand my colleagues' concerns also. Um, and and your relationship with the timber industry. We import our timber from Oregon too, so you know the cost goes up. We pay, and we have we still have to ship that. But uh, well, thank you, sir, for 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 all you do, and uh, thank you for joining us this morning. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman now. Recognize gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Tipton, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for being here, Chief Tidwell. Um, Pleased to hear some of your testimony. We've had a few conversations in terms of our ability to be able to harvest in Colorado, uh, downstanding dead timber, uh, to be able to turn that into biomass, to be able to keep a mill going. Uh, and also some problems that we have with our utilities as well, being able to get in and clear out under those lines. But what do you see as the biggest impediment to uh, managing the forest uh, in the bark beetle epidemic? You know, the, probably just the scale of the work that needs to be done, um, you know, right away to pr protect our communities um, and provide for the public safety. And then the thing, the biggest challenge, especially there in Colorado, is is the loss of the um, infrastructure, the integrated wood products industry, to be able to, um, you know, be able to, to use this material and to be able to have markets that will offset the cost of uh, removing it. That's one of the, I'll say in Colorado, one of the biggest challenges. And where I've worked in other parts of the country where we've lost that wood products industry, it is very expensive for us to be able to then to do the restoration work, to be able to thin out these forests, not only to protect, you know, the communities from wildfire, but just to in, improve overall f uh, forest health. That's why we're, we're focused on doing everything we can to be able to maintain the infrastructure we currently have and then in a few places be able to, to um, look at using long-term uh, stewardship contracts to be able to provide the, uh, the incentive for, um, for someone to come in and make a new investment, you know, either in a new mill or in a new operation. Those are the things that I, I look at as some of the biggest challenges that we have. Okay, could you maybe describe for us a, a few of the ideas that you have in terms of our local for, forest service officers uh, exercising creativity and having some reg regulatory flexibility to be able to address some of those concerns? Well, 
I've talked about the uh, the NEPA efficiencies, right. so that we can look at these much larger landscapes. I mean, instead of looking at 500 to 1,000 acres at a time, to be looking at tens of thousands of acres, so that we can um, have you know one analysis that'll cover a lot of country and provide a lot of work over many years. The other thing is through our stewardship contracts. We've found that this um, contracting authority has been uh, very beneficial. We find that we have less appeals, less uh, um, lawsuits when we're using stewardship contracting authority, and that provides, allows us to be able to do multiple year contracts, to have contracts up to 10 years that will you know, encourage um, you know, someone to make the investment. The other thing is to look at um, use, using all the flexibility we have with when we're laying out a project um, instead of uh, you know in the past um, I often would uh, you know go out there and mark every tree that needed to be cut we have other flexibilities to be able to use either weight scaling or this um, des designation by prescription so that we can lay out how we want the area to look afterwards and then be able to then let the timber operator go in there and remove uh, remove the trees based on that prescription and we find this is another way that we can you know save um, you know some of the cost and make it a little bit easier for us to be able to you know get more work done these are some of the things that we're we're looking at we're also um doing everything that we can to um to work with the industry um you know, especially with some of their past uh, timber sale contracts that they purchased when we had a better market and to be able to think we can to adjust those rates or in, in the case there in Colorado to actually cancel some timber sales that just were no longer economically viable because it's essential that we do what we can to be able to maintain the, the industry. Okay. Uh, could you speak maybe briefly a little bit to uh, the importance of existing utility infrastructure on Forest Service lands? Uh, providing electricity to America, which we need, and uh, how we can help protect that? Well, it's essential that, you know, we work with utility companies to be able that they can maintain their lines and that um, they're able to do the clearing underneath those those power lines so when we do get a fire started, uh, we don't lose lose that line. So one of the things there with the challenges with the, uh, the mountain pine beetle outbreak, especially in your state, in other parts of the West is that utility companies were, were faced with a, a much larger job to be able to you know, clear those lines and not only the material underneath the lines but any of the trees that could fall. Now, I'm going to run out of time. Uh, could, you, could you maybe just give a little touch and, and uh, let us know are there any re regulatory or legal impediments to the Forest Service to use contractors or the utilities themselves as contractors to be able to remove underneath the lines? Um, I believe we have the the uh, flexibility in our current authorities to work with the utility companies to be able to remove what they need to underneath their lines, and then also to be able to work with them to actually um, uh, address uh, adjacent areas too. It's one of the things we're looking at is being able to use that that contracting flexibility um, for not just uh, within the permit, but also how we can work together to be able to get more of the work done while they have the equipment in place. So just to be clear, so you don't see any legal impediments? Uh, we're, we're looking into our current authorities, and, um, and I am, I'd like to get back to you on that. If, if I find that we've exhausted our flexibility and there's a need for additional um, flexibility, um, I'd like to come back to you with that. Okay, I'd appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, thanks, gentlemen. Um, I think we'll uh, we have uh, a request for uh, one more round, if that's okay with the chief. Uh, and I'll uh, start that out with, uh, with my five minutes, uh, chief. I want to come back to stewardship contracts. You had uh, talked about those with with Mr. Tipton, and and you uh, obviously identified them that uh, the key role that they play. Uh, within our forests, uh, I believe within your written testimony, it was like 19% of the timber that was uh, uh, harvested was under stewardship contracts, and uh, and I appreciate you know you 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 identified kind of uh, the uh, long term. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, my question really has to do with the, uh, the the economic benefit to the communities. Now, obviously, there's some long terms that you addressed. Healthy forests are good for our communities because they they keep that viable forest available for uh, for timbering and all the other uses. And then, uh, obviously, fire safety. 
Um, is uh, and this is just a point of clarification. I'm not sure about this. Does the stewardship contracts have the same uh, short-term economic benefits that other timber sales have uh, in terms of monies coming back into the local counties and communities and school districts that uh, a, a, a traditional timber sale would have? With the stewardship contract, it there isn't any of the of the uh, revenues that are set aside um, to, to go back to the you know to the counties, but the but the difference is that in the the number of jobs that are created, because through a stewardship contract we look at the uh, the landscape, and look at all the work that needs to be done, and then we put together one contract that not only does the timber harvest, but it also does the road work, it does the culvert replacement, the trail improvement. And all of that then creates jobs, so that the revenue that would um, come from the biomass, from the, the uh, timber harvest, it goes back into the, the site to do more work. So it creates more jobs. So the economic benefits are in more jobs that are created through a stewardship contract versus a timber sale contract. We need both. And we're going to continue to, to hopefully have both authorities so that we can look at any one project and pick what is the right tool. What is, is a timber cell contract the right tool? Or should we just go, should we use a stewardship uh, contract? Well, I appreciate hearing that because that, that would be what I would hope for is we would um, use it to expand uh, both. Um, the one thing I wouldn't want to see, obviously, is that uh, that that 19 percent of production next year go to 25 percent of production because that tells me that on the traditional timber sales because I, I and you having all the you've come from the you worked your way up through the ranks uh, to position chief so you've lived in those rural communities and you know how important economically the lifeblood is of of timbering uh, really is the key function uh, uh, within their communities. It can either crush a community or or make it uh, economically, keep it economically viable. So um, you noted in your testimony that the market for forest products is critical for forest restoration efforts and forest service policies have arguably contributed to uh, to the uh, struggling markets that you reference as dramatic reductions in timber sales in some parts of the country decimated market ecology of the local timber industry. Now, I appreciate your thoughts on ways the Forest Service can partner with industry to facilitate the development of consistent and sustainable markets for forest products across the different regions of the National Forest System. What, what did you have in mind when you identified that in your testimony? Well, one of the things, we can do a better job to um, you know, work with the industry to be able to um, you know, lay out our pro uh, plan program of work um, in conjunction with what is expected to come off of, of state or, or private land. And for instance, right now we're seeing, um, uh, we have a very high demand for, um, you know, for our timber sales right now. We're, um, I think last year, even in this, this market, which is, as is explained to me, one of the most difficult, um, especially softwood markets that we've had in a long, long time. But we were able to sell 98% of the uh, timber sales that we put up last year. And that's because of being able to, to work together. And so in, a, in markets like this where we see a, a significant reduction in the amount of um, um, you know, timber sales on private land, that there is a, a, a greater need uh, for us to be able to um, be able to work with uh, you know the industry to be able to have more of our restoration work ready to go in time in times like this. These are the sort of things that you know ideally we need to be able to do a better job in the future to be able to um, kind of be able to have more of a all lands approach on this and be able to work together so that we're able to get the work done, but at the same time we're doing what we need to do to be able to support um, the industry um, and especially in these tough times that we're facing right now. Thank you, Chief. Now I recognize Mr. Schrader for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chief, for, for uh, listening to us and uh, respond to our, our concerns and questions. Uh, one of the species I'm most worried about in the forest areas is called the human species. And uh, rural America is solely dying on the vine here. And I'd hope that in your landscape NEPA analysis, you, you would uh, take that into account a little bit. In my state, uh, the NEPA uh, analysis does not work very well. Uh, as in some of the testimony, I guess we're going to hear later, it actually is so cost prohibitive that uh, uh, very few sales get done. And frankly, a lot of the sales uh, uh, are not subscribed to. 
at the end of the day. So uh, that would be an indicator that indeed things are terribly wrong and uh, look forward to you changing things there. I would hope that part of the strategy might be to uh, uh, use uh, you know, HIFRA uh, 1 and maybe even go to a HIFRA 2. Uh, we're trying to work that through our process here uh, to look at class 2 and class 3 lands. How are you uh, trying to approach class 2 and class 3 uh, for us? Well, we want to be able to look at um, the work that needs to be done on, on the landscape and then to be able to, to move forward um, and implement that decision. You know, and so once again, um, we want to use all the, the authorities we, we currently have in place and to make sure that we're using the right authorities so that we actually can implement the decision. Um, we've made a lot of good decisions in the past and we often win in court. I mean, we win. Not my state, you don't. Well, the other um, states you do, but not my state. The majority of the time, um, we'll win. But what happens is it takes years. And so we'll go two or three you years. Regularly. You have a statement in here, Mr. Tidwell. Uh, due to changing climate, we may not be able to restore them, uh, talking about our, our river and ecosystems, to their original condition, but we can move them toward ecological integrity and health. You know what the courts in Oregon say? They say even if originally the streams were at a certain temperature uh, that's not necessarily conducive to Andromeda's fish, uh, you have to do it even better than what history has. I mean, that's the type of stuff we're up against in Oregon. Maybe, you know, out west it's a little different than back east here. We have huge, huge obstacles to uh, get this done. In your new landscape NEPA analysis, it's going to take longer because it is obviously watershed wide and trying to be more comprehensive. What assurances do you have from the legal community or some of the more extreme environmental groups that they're not going to see you on a project by project basis after you do all that work? Well, I'm, I'm confident as we move forward and we do the work and we do the required analysis that we'll be able to, um, you know, implement those decisions. The other thing that, we're that we see that's changing is that we have a lot of support from the conservation community and a lot of the environmental groups that want to work with us. And especially in these large scale projects that those would you agree? I'm sorry, again, I have limited time too, and I apologize for interrupting. But would you agree that the constant litigation is a huge barrier uh, to getting any of these management uh, uh, projects done in our national forests? Uh, litigation takes up a lot of time and has has been a barrier. However, we are um, we're doing a better job to have less appeals and less litigation. In fact, last year in, in 2011, we only had 3% of our, our timber cell um, that were litigated, which is the lowest level of, of any time that, that I can ever, ever remember. So these things that we're doing, this collaborative doing approach it. is making a difference. Well, I appreciate that, Chief. I know your, your intentions are honorable and good, and I don't want to be a contrarian. Just so that in the real world that I live in, in my state, where a quarter of the land mass of Oregon is national forest system. My communities are dying. I'd ask you to put your attention on that. And by the way, you do have the analysis that uh, uh, draft I talked about the, uh, to deal with our ONC and forest lands out west. I urge you to take a look at that, if you don't mind. Thank you. Sir. Yield back. Thank you. I recognize Mr. Ribble for additional five minutes. Thanks again, Mr. Chairman. And uh, <coughs> the comments from my good friend from Oregon resonate with me a bit because I want to talk about a small community in northeastern uh, mm -hmm. Wisconsin called Leona. They're right in the heart of the Shawamigan Nicolay National Forest, uh, which used to have one of the most robust timber harvesting areas uh, in the state. Now, due to lost employment and lost harvesting capacity, we're about to lose our school district. If we lose our school system, we lose our community. There's no reason for families to stay. There's no reason for children to come home. And uh, without those jobs, we're going to lose those communities. And so, to my colleague from Oregon, I completely appreciate the dilemma you, your communities find yourself in because Wisconsin has the same problem. Um, Chief Tidwell, along that same line uh, and following up uh, uh, with Representative uh, Schrader, uh, in Wisconsin, we ha you have been a bit more successful on uh, some of your court challenges and court cases. Um, in fact, 300 million board, f board feet of sales have passed through the court challenges now and are ready to be harvested, yet only 65 million board feet will be sold this year. Why, why the discrepancy? Can you help me understand that a little bit? 
Mr. Congressman, when we um, were able to work through, um, you know, those those past decisions, so we could move forward with them, it takes a little bit of time to then be able to get out there and um, be able to, uh, you know, put that decision on the ground to be able to prepare the uh, the timber sales. So we've actually sent some additional money um, up to that region, and the region itself had already focused on, um, you know, moving forward with that. And so it just there's a little bit of a lag to be able to to move our limited resources to um, to move forward in an, in an area. Um, ideally, we'd, it'd be nice if we had a, you know additional resources that we could just quickly move there. But as you've heard from um, you know the other members that you know we're dealing with this same issue everywhere across the country and all of our national forests. And so. That's where it's been a little bit of, of a lag, and I would hope that not only will they be able to increase it this year, but then also next year, uh, they'll be able to put those additional sales up. Uh, on behalf of several hundred school children, I would ask you to hurry. Um, I, I, another, just another comment. Um, back in 1987, we were harvesting about 12.7 billion board feet off our national forests. Uh, with your proposed plan, you want to get back to 2.6 billion, maybe to 3 billion by 2014. That's still only about 20% of where we were at two decades ago. Uh, right now, um, uh, some of my uh, lumber mills are importing lumber from Canada when we should be exporting to Canada. If we really want to talk about the job paradigm, uh, that would be one way of getting there. Uh, rather than buying Canadian timber, let's harvest our own. Um, but going back to the my question earlier about uh, forest fires, in, uh, insect open spaces, all your comments. Um, will annual forest harvest of 3 billion board feet be enough to address the nearly 82 million acres of national forest lands in need of restoration? Um, the, the answer is, is, no, is no. We'll need to be able to do more. Of that um, 65 to 82 million, there's a lot of those ar areas we'll treat with this fire. A lot of it's not commercial timberland. But there is a minimum of there's 12 and a half million acres that we know we have to use mechanical treatment, timber harvest on to restore those those acres. And so to be able to do that along with maintaining all the other areas, because we have to also continue to do the maintenance and not just on the restoration, we're going to be able, we're going to need to do more. I'm optimistic as we move forward with uh, implementing this list of opportunities I laid out today that we're going to continue to be able to um, you know, increase our efficiencies to be able to you know, um, actually treat more acres and thus will produce more saw timber, more biomass. Um, but you know, this is, uh, I, feel, um, I feel confident that we're going to be able to do this and that we're going to do this with our current budgets. Um, that's the other thing that um, you know, my estimations are all based on our, the president's budget request. Um, so, uh, you know, and if that doesn't hold hold true, then I'll probably have to be up here having another discussion with you. But but with a flat budget, but we feel that we can increase the number of acres we're treating and increase the number of um, uh, the amount of saw timber by 20 percent. Um, when we get to three billion and talk about the successes we've had there, then we'll be talking about what else we need to do to be able to move forward. Thank you for thanks again for for being here, and I yield back. Thanks, gentlemen. Now uh, recognize uh, uh, the a colleague from Florida, Mr. Southern, on five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Tidwell, thank you very much. And I, I want to say how much I appreciated uh, your personal visit uh, to my office and uh, to discuss uh, uh, our our forests. And um, I want to uh, really, though, echo you know the the sense of urgency uh, as a small business owner. Uh, who had never served in elected office before, uh, you can imagine my dismay uh, that um, that this city has no sense of urgency when it comes to really meeting the needs of the American people, uh, the, the communities that are dying, the children who unfortunately are not going to be able to go to rural schools because we are not producing uh, what it is our responsibility to produce. Um, and, and I've been here 15 months, and, and yet um, uh, that, that, that aggravation and anger uh, that is inside of me uh, has not subsided uh, because I'm interested in results, and, and, and I'm not interested, nor are the American people, uh, in, in talk. And it, that's cheap, uh, and that doesn't put food on the table for the American people, the hardworking men and women who are struggling. Uh, to to uh, survive, uh, and you have I think a unique opportunity 
in your position. Um, uh, I, I was pleased with our visit, uh, but um, I'm going to hold you accountable to, uh, to results um, because I do believe that uh, we must do more than just talk. Uh, the American people expect a Congress, for example, to pass a budget, and yet we haven't. So they're aggravated, and they should be. Uh, our small communities, especially around our national forests, expect us to harvest our timber, mm -hmm. and yet we don't. Uh, so therefore, the same aggravation that uh, I think is, is levied at us, uh, leveled at us, uh, I think is, is leveled at, at, at your department because, and your agency because we are, not, uh, uh, we are not doing, I don't think, what the American people need us to do. Closer to my home, um, you know, being in Florida, the uh, Apalachicola National Forest is critical uh, to the rural, com rural communities around the Apalachicola National Forest. And now, um, I mean, we're only cutting 6.8% percent of its annual growth. Uh, the mortality rate exceeds uh, the harvest rate. Uh, and you may have uh, addressed this, and if you had before I came in a few moments ago, I apologize, but I would ask you to, to uh, state again. Um, does that create any sense of urgency deep inside of you? Because the anger that I feel about this place that it doesn't even sometimes appear to be listening to the cries and the hurts of the American people. Deep inside of you, does that statistic, 6.8 annual growth when our mortality rate is, is higher than that, what does that produce inside of you? It, it produces what I've shared, the urgency for us to be able to increase the, uh, the pace and the scale of our restoration work, um, the active management of our national forests. Um, to be able to address the forest health concerns. And so uh, I share your same concerns. And it's one of the things why we are um, focused on doing what we can to improve our efficiencies so that we can get more work done um, out there on the ground and get more. Um, but, uh, but let me say this. The American people work faster than your people. One thing I've noticed about government, OK? Give me. Two, I mean, serious, serious people that are that are that are out there in the private sector. Okay, they're risking their life each and every day in one of the most dangerous professions in the country. Okay, but what fear, what what, what creates more fear in them than the danger of their job is the danger of defaulting mm -hmm. on the skidders and the loaders and the bunchers. Okay, that they are leveraged against. And then to come and have to con have to deal with people that have no sense of urgency, that are not in a hurry, that don't work fast, you can see the aggravation of the American people. What I'm saying is, is, is you know, several of my colleagues have said, "Hurry, I we need hurry," and and, and I, I'm I want to be honest, and I don't want to be, I don't want to be mean spirited, but there is a sense of urgency that I do not see, and these numbers do not bear out that there's the sense of urgency that the American people have. The president can talk about jobs being the number one priority in his administration. But quite honestly, sir, that's not true. It's just not true. Because if it were, then the sense of urgency that you claim is inside of you would bear out an in increased production from our national forest and helping our communities and our, our schools that we make reference to all over this country. You understand how what the rhetoric that is said does not match the facts. Well, Mr. Congressman, I share your urgency. Um, I've lived in those rural communities. Um, our employees live in those rural communities. You know, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. And that's why you'll see that each, each of the last few years, we've been increasing the amount of work, increasing the timber harvest that's been occurring, um, you know, with, with not an increase in budget, without any increase in, you know, changes in the authorities or in the laws. But we've been able to be able to do that. And we're going to continue to, um, to maximize these efficiencies so that we can get more work done. I share with you that, that urgency. Uh, it's the other reason why we're doing everything we can to work with the uh, industry to, um, to do rate adjustments on, on contracts, to, uh, to do everything we can to uh, you know, keep them um, in business so that they can do the work, so that they can employ people to be able to, to get the work that has to be done on these national forests. 
So I am. I share the urgency, but I. But, also, but I want to be very clear. I know I'm over my time, and I, I apologize, Mr. Chairman. Uh, but I, but I know that if you look at the number of mills we had in this country in 1970 compared to what we have now, what you just said is banter. And and I want to be very polite. Okay, but you can't you can't eliminate because of policy, hundreds of mills in this country. And the statement you just made hold any validity with the American people that are in the timber industry. I just, I, I need, we need, America needs what we say to match what we do to restore integrity that we lost a long time ago with the American people. And you are on the front lines of that. And I urge you, I implore upon you to make sure that our banter matches our actions. Mr. Chairman, I apologize. I've gone over and uh, yield back time that I have <laughs> exceeded into. Uh, well, I thank the gentleman. And Chief, I want to thank you for uh, for being here. We uh, obviously, uh, this is a subcommittee that we, uh, I think we share the same passion as you do, and that's to vibrant, healthy forests and vibrant rural communities. And, uh, and I will say, I, I think our public policy for, for forestry uh, for decades has been hijacked through the courts and special interest groups that uh, self-fund their organizations by suing your agency and, and uh, keeping us from, from having healthy forests and keeping us from having healthy rural communities. Um, but uh, I know your commitment to work with us to to bring a new public policy uh, on the issue of forestry that has vibrant healthy forests and vibrant healthy communities. You know, it's a sad fact today that, you know, I think in uh, many rural communities uh, across this great nation uh, that uh, the number one endangered species are the citizens and the communities that are located in or near our national forests. And uh, I think it's all of our job to change that, obviously, and get them off that endangered species list. So thank you, uh, Chief. We really appreciate you coming in. Okay. Well, thank you. That's fine. I'd like to uh, now welcome the second panel witnesses to the table. And We have uh, our second panel witnesses here, and as they uh, will find their place at the table, we'll uh, proceed with some introductions. I want to thank our second panel. And for purpose of the introduction of the uh, first speaker, uh, our first witness, uh, uh, I'll turn to uh, my good friend from Oregon, uh, Dr. Schrader. Thank you very again, uh, again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, really pleased uh, uh, to have uh, Gary Barth, uh, our Director of Business and Community Services for my home county of Clackamas, Oregon. Uh, as uh, Director, Gary oversees the Economic Development Department, uh, County Parks, North Clackamas Parks and Recreation District, County Libraries, uh, Property Resources, and quite a bit of my county's efforts. Uh, and management of nearly 3,000 acres of county-owned forest land. Uh, prior to his public service career, he worked in the financial industry, earned a business degree from Portland State, and MBA from University of Oregon, or University of Portland, excuse me. Uh, really appreciate you, Mr. Barth, for coming. Thank you. Thanks, gentlemen. It's my pleasure to introduce our, our second witness to the panel, and that's uh, Mr. Gregory Hoover uh, from the Department of Entomology at uh, Land, the Great Land Grant University, Pennsylvania State University. Uh, and uh, he is uh, over his uh, lifetime uh, dedicated himself to healthy forests and uh, the studies of all those bugs that uh, uh, Per, just per, provide a tremendous uh, risk to uh, healthy forests and the, the wildlife habitat and all the good things that come with it. So, Mr. Hoover, I want to thank you for being here to testify. And uh, now turn to uh, uh, my good friend from Florida, Mr. Sutherland, for purpose of uh, introduction. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it, it is always a great honor to have our constituents uh, uh, here from our districts. And uh, today I'm, I'm proud to introduce uh, Chuck Watkins. Chuck uh, is the Chief Operating Officer of Rex Lumber Company, which operates businesses in both uh, uh, in, in, in multiple areas throughout Florida. The family-owned company uh, is a founding member of the Federal Forest Resource Coalition, which represents uh, purchasers of, for, of forest service timber across the country. The coalition has members in more than 24 states with approximately 650 member companies representing 350,000 workers and about $19 billion uh, in payroll. Uh, you know, with, with, uh, I want to say that, that uh, Rex Lumber Company uh, traces its roots root back to Northwest Florida uh, back to 1926, 10 years prior to the establishment of the Apalachicola National Forest, which I made reference to a few moments ago in my questioning. Uh, Rex currently operates mills uh, throughout my district in Bristol and Graceful, Florida, and other regions of the country, employing 434 people and sourcing much of their materials from the Apalachicola National Forest in Florida. Mr. Watkins, thank you so much for being here today. No, I thank the gentleman. Now, for purposes of introduction, uh, Mr. Ribble from Wisconsin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's an uh, honor today to introduce Gary Zimmer. Uh, Gary is the lead wildlife biologist for the Ruffle Grouse Society, in charge of the society's four regional biologists. Uh, as an interesting side note, Mr. Zimmer spent 20 years in the U.S. Forest Service. Um, he coordinated multifaceted district fish, wildlife, and endangered and threatened species program. Uh, he's been uh, in a small town that I re referenced uh, with uh, Mr. Tidwell of Leona, Wisconsin. He's acutely aware of uh, what is going on in our national forests uh, in northern Wisconsin. Uh, and, and his role uh, with the Ruffalo Grouse Society is to increase public understanding of the role of forest management to society members, landowners, and the general public, and to provide technical and financial assistance in support of habitat development on public lands and habitat management. Uh, Mr. Zimmer, it's an honor to have you here, and thank you for coming. Mr. Chairman. Thanks, gentlemen. Well, uh, we'll begin with our testimony now. Mr. Barth, please begin when you're ready. The, the uh, timing system is in front of you there, and uh, please proceed with your five minutes. Congressman Schrader and subcommittee members, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to testify today on the opportunities and challenges facing the management of our national force. As Congressman Schrader said, my name is Gary Barth. I'm the Director of Business and Community Services for Clackamas County, Oregon. As Director of Business and Community Services, I oversee a diverse number of divisions that include county libraries, an urban park and recreation district, county-owned forest land, a county-wide park system, and the economic development team. My job title reflects the recognition of the integral relationship that exists between economic vitality and the services we provide to offer the improvement the quality of life of our citizens. In my position, I have a unique perspective on seeking to improve all aspects of the triple bottom line so often discussed and considered in establishing public policy. How do we produce economic value, ensure environmental responsibility, and provide for social benefits? I believe that our county's management of our 3,000 acres of county-owned forest land is a great example of delivering that triple bottom line to our local re residents through good stewardship of public assets. My testimony is intended to provide greater detail on how we manage our forests and how our approach could serve as a model for needed changes in federal forest management policies. As Congressman Schrader mentioned, the state of Oregon is uh, vastly uh, made up of federal forests in Clackamas County, even more so, 75% of Clackamas County is forest land. We're perceived as an urban county. We're part of the greater Portland metro region, one of three counties making up the greater Portland area. But only 5% of our land is urban. 38% uh, is rural agricultural land, and over 50% is forest land. Over 50% is in ownership of and control of the U.S. Forest Service and the BLM. Forests have always been an important part of our economy and culture. Unfortunately, employment in our forest and wood products manufacturing has been a steady decline for decades. The primary cause of this decline has been changes in the federal forest management policies. The amount of timber sold on Mount Hood National Forest has declined 87% over the last two decades, from 230 million board feet in the late 80s to an estimated 30 million today. But the annual mortality rate is 190 million board feet. Putting that in the context, the Mount Hood National Forest is dying six times faster than it's being harvested. 
The annual growth of the forest is 745 million board feet. Again, in context, it's growing 25 times faster than it's being productively harvested. The economic opportunity lost through mortality and lack of sustained harvest is enormous, as is the growing risk to the forest health and the lack of management. We're relying on federal payments. That's why we're here today also talking a little bit about the reauthorization of secure rural schools. But since the early uh, 1900s when the National Forest System was established, our government has shared in 25% of the receipts generated off the commodity of the forest. BLM ONC lands, once private, were brought back under federal control with an initial commitment to share 75%, later reduced to 50%. For decades, Clackamas County received millions of dollars in shared timber receipts annually, and many local residents were employed in the forest product sector. Due to the vast amount of land and federal ownership and the dramatic decline in timber harvest, unemployment has risen, mills have closed, and counties have had to deal with devastating declines in revenue. Again, this has been partially offset by the introduction of spotted owl guarantee payments in the early 1990s and then secure rural schools funding from the Self-Determination Act of 2000, since reauthorized twice. However, the current secure rural schools has now expired. We received our last payment. And because of the calculation, the final year of the reauthorization, our last payment was a quarter of what we've historically received on secure rural schools. And even that was less than what we had received on commodity revenue sharing. Clackamas County Board of County Commissioners supports the reauthorization of secure rural schools. It's abundantly clear, however, that the Secure Rural Schools Act does not represent a long-term sustainable funding solution, nor does it provide needed employment opportunities. Now, specifically about our plan, as mentioned, uh, we have 3,600 acres of forest owned by Clackamas County. That's roughly split one-fourth in active parks and preservation areas, about three-fourths in a sustainable timber harvest program. All activities on our timber harvest and reforestation program are done in accordance with and actually exceed the requirements of the Oregon Forest Practices Act. We manage harvest on a 55-year rotation so that we can mill those, that product locally and we can harvest the amount of annual growth. This annual harvest, very outcome-based. We look to generate roughly $750,000 a year in revenue. That pays for the management of our forest management program and provides needed funding to support my 1,000 acres of active park space. I do not receive any general fund support for any of my divisions in business and community services. They're all self-funding through various other revenue streams, including county parks and forests. So we often think, what if? What if the U.S. Forest Service lands were managed similar to the Clackamas County? in the way we manage our forests. If you just took half of the U.S. Forest Service lands in Clackamas County, that would be the equivalent of 90 of my 3,000 acres. If I can generate $750,000 a year, 90 times that would be $67 million per year. That would be enough revenue to certainly fund local Forest Service operations and the management of those harvests, provide shared receipts to the county comparable to the historical levels we used to face, and provide net revenue to the U.S. Treasury. The impact on the private sector is just as dramatic. We harvest 2 million board feet per year. 90 times that would be 180 million board feet. At 17 direct jobs per board foot per million board feet, that would be 3,000 new high wage jobs and probably double that when you look at the indirect and induced. Lower un unemployment equals less dependency on public support. We'd have additional revenues coming in for needed public services with less demand. That's a great combination for our county. Forest management legislation, Clackamas County believes that federal legislation is needed to restore responsible management to federal forest lands, provide a sustainable and predictable long-term solution to county revenue needs and restore economic vitality to our communities. The current federal forest management policies are broken and our rural communities and forests are paying the price. Ultimately, any legislation should balance economic, social, and environmental values. We, in fact, exceed Oregon Standard Practices Act as well as SFI certification standards in our management practices. Congressman Schrader recently joined with Congressman DeFazio and Walden to release the ONC Trust Conservation Jobs Act. Similar to the what-if scenario just discussed, that plan would manage approximately half of Oregon's 2.5 million acres of BNL, BLM ONC lands to yield timber production the benefit of 18 ONC counties. And stable timber supply would support manufacturing and other jobs while providing revenue to cash-strapped counties. I would like to commend the efforts of Congressman Schrader and other members of the Oregon delegation, management that will provide a sustainable and predictable long-term solution to county revenue needs, 
and create much needed employment opportunities for our citizens and ensure economic protection. As this committee considers possible legislation for the National Forest, I will hope it, hope it will look to the management of our forest as well as the proposed ONC legislation as examples. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today and would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Ms. Barth. Mr. Hoover, we'll go ahead and proceed for five minutes testimony. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to provide an entomologist view of the impacts and challenges of the invasive pests on the management and maintenance of the health of our forests. I appreciate the subcommittee's interest in this matter of great importance, and that is the health of our nation's forests for future generations. More than 400 species of invasive forest insects and diseases are currently established in the United States. Some of these insects are able to spread quickly and cause significant economic and ecological impact to our nation's forest and urban trees. An estimate of the management costs associated with invasive insect and mite pests in our nation's forest land is at least $2.1 billion a year. The cost of insecticides applied against introduced pest insects is approximately $500 million a year in the U.S. Suburban and urban areas of the Northeast through the years have been locations of first detection of many invasive forest tree pests. For many years, scientists conducting basic and applied research and extension education activities in the disciplines of entomology and plant pathology have a long history of studying the biology and ecology of invasive forest pests and strategies and methods for their effective management. Collaborative research between entomologists and plant pathologists at land-grant institutions, state and federal governmental agencies, and others on tree diseases vectored by insects often leads to discoveries that result in the development of decision-making tools for achieving the goal of healthy forest and urban landscape trees. Some invasive species that impact the health of forest trees on which research and extension activities are currently being conducted include the emerald ash borer, hemlock woolly adelgid, Asian longhorn beetle, and for years, the gypsy moth. Examples of diseases in the forest that are caused by invasive plant pathogens include sudden oak death and butternut canker. Some insect vectored tree diseases that many of us are already familiar with include elm yellows, oak wilt, beech bark disease, Dutch elm disease, and most recently, thousand cankers disease on black walnut. In my written testimony, I discuss a few invasive insect pests that have impacted the health of our trees in our nation, nation's forests. Additionally, I've highlighted some research that has been conducted on these pests by entomologists, plant pathologists, chemical ecologists, horticulturists, regulatory agency employees, and others. Some research priorities associated with these invasive pests are also suggested that may lead to discoveries allowing for more effective management and maintenance of the health of the trees in our forests and landscapes. Many members of the subcommittee have used that word that frustrates many forest tree managers, and that's the word drought. Um, I can only tell you that with wood boring insects, their olfactory abilities to sense trees that are stressed is beyond belief as to what we've dis been able to discover, and there still is an awful lot of insight, insight we need to investigate in how they perceive direct attack on, on trees that they can visualize and when they get closer there are chemical cues and yes with some longhorn beetles when they land on the tree they determine that those plant cells are collapsing due to lack of water and so we really have our work cut out when it comes to wood boring insects attack on trees in our nation's forests. This concludes my prepared statement, and I would be pleased to answer any questions you may have regarding the role invasive pests play in the challenge of managing and maintaining the health of our nation's forests. Thank you, Mr. Hoover. Mr. Watkins, go ahead. When you're ready, proceed for five minutes testimony. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm here as the uh, representative of Rex Lumber. 
Um, as, as Mr. Sutherland spoke, we, we employ 434 people, produce about 450 million feet of, of, of lumber um, in a support commission, as Mr. Ribble said before. We are, we are a gross exporter of lumber. About 20% of our lumber is exported out of this country to, to the Caribbean. Um, so our mill is sitting on the, the doorstep of the Appalachicola National Forest. And then uh, 1980, that was built. Mr. Hoover, is your microphone still on? It's off. And where are the feedbacks? Sorry about that, sir. We're used to all the getting feedback here. <laughs> Since we don't want it to interfere with your testimony. Is that better? That's great. Please go ahead. I'm sorry about that. So our, our, we, we built a, a mill, a lumber producing facility in Bristol, Florida in 1980 um, with the kind of a verbal agreement with the Forest Service that we would get a lot of timber off of that land. That land uh, covers a vast, vast area around us. So as that timber supply was, was, was basically reduced, um, it took a lot of our area away. So now we're, you know, over the course of the 90s and the 2000s, we are forced to, to buy timber and outsource and, and basically push away from the mill. Um, and we all know what fuel cost, what that does to us. The reason was this little uh, bird called the red cockaded woodpecker. Well, we essentially reduced uh, a lot of the, the harvesting on that forest. And so what we found through some studies through between 2000 and 2009 is that the density of that forest has gone up by 30%. And that red cockaded woodpecker likes open park stands, pine uh, park type uh, of an environment. And it's actually, its population has decreased by 15%. Um, so that's a little story of, of, of our mill and we, we wonder as business owners and employers and, and members of our community, why? Why is that happening? Um, the, our national forest supports uh, over 770 red cockaded woodpecker clusters, over 2,000 black bears, over 60 bald eagle nests. And frankly, we could do better. We, we could certainly do better. But I'm here representing the Federal Forestry Resource Co or Federal Forest Resource Coalition, um, with the membership group in 24 states. We have 650 member companies, 350,000 employees, and 19 billion dollars in payroll. And what we ask of you is that the the Forest Service has stated that they're going to increase their harvest to three billion board feet. And then we're asking to increase it again to three and a half billion board feet in, in 2013. But keep in mind that that represents less than 10% of the growth of our forests. And actually that represents less than 50% of what their targets are, what their goals are now. So as what we ask as a group is that we need some transparency in the Forest Service. We need to put. Uh, we need to see what they're doing and understand what they're doing and see some results. We would like to see some type of progress reports. Um, the uh, recession from 2008 to 2011 was was uh, very tough on our industry. Our employment decreased by 50 percent across the country, um, and. The, the ironic part of that is that as these as we lose these employees and we lose these mills and these these manufacturing facilities that actually is detrimental to the Forest Service but the Forest Service does not they're they're losing partners in managing this land and managing their timber harvest so what we'd like to stress to the committee is that the the health of the national forests the economic health of the member companies of our group and the health of the communities where we live are all linked together. So we, we would ask for your support and, and, and with the Forest Service and, and some transparency, some progress supports 
and ensuring that we, we reach those goals. We are optimistic, but we are very cautious. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now recognize uh, Mr. Zimmer for uh, five minutes of testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I I'm going to stray a little bit from my comments, just from what I've heard today. One point that I'd like to make is that 12 years ago, I made one of the toughest decisions, probably almost the toughest decision of my life when I left the U.S. Forest Service. It was the first organization that really uh, gave me the chance to become and, and exercise wild, my wildlife management skills that I had learned and, and grew up loving as a career. <clears throat> that lasted. We did some great work, had a good family relationship with the folks I worked with, some of the best people I've ever worked with. That changed as things changed in the organization, and I became a NEPA writer. All I did every day was writing documents, writing documents, writing documents, and writing documents. I left 12 years ago. One of the documents that I was working on 12 years ago was one of the uh, documents that uh, Chief Tidwell referred to that just finally passed the court system and is now being implemented. I feel good about that. I was part of the start, and I guess I'll be part of the finish. Sitting back in the audience today, I realized yesterday would have been my first day I would have been eligible for retirement from the U.S. Forest Service. I think I made a good choice because I feel I do a lot more on the ground work for the benefit of wildlife species, especially those of my constituents in the society and those 15,000 members of the society nationwide asked me to do. I'm not sure in the last 12 years I could have done that being uh, employed in a sense by the taxpayer of this nation. Also, I'd like to say one other thing. I'm also proud that I have 157 acres of woods in northern Wisconsin that is certified under the Forest Stewardship Council and the Sustainable Forestry Initiative third-party certification process. I join many, many other uh, private landowners in the state of Wisconsin, many industry landowners, many state and county landowners that are have uh, that, I mean, not landowners, but state and county forests that are, uh, have this certification. The only large forest landowner in the state of Wisconsin that is not certified is our national forest. That is sad. That's very, very sad. And uh, we meet all the criteria of all these other landowners, and I wish the Forest Service would be. A pilot study was done a few years ago, and the Schwamigan Nicolay was in that pilot study. And one of the biggest uh, impediments to going for forward with certification was that they weren't sustainable. These forests weren't sustainable, and in, in, in part was because of litigation. I am really here today, though, to emphasize the critical role that active forest management plays in sustaining wildlife populations dependent on young forest habitats. Today, active forest management, through the use of commercial forests, provide the only realistic opportunity to maintain the range of forested habitats needed to sustain wildlife diversity. Unfortunately, this active forest management, especially on our national forests, has fallen well behind forest management goals, as you've heard today. As a result, young deciduous forest habitats, those less than 20 years old, have decreased by 33% over the past decade and has, a, has had a significant effect on wildlife habitats. In 2007, the American Bird Conservancy listed the early successional deciduous forest habitats in the eastern part of the country as one of the nation's 20 most threatened bird habitats. These dense young forests that provide important protection from predators and feeding areas for young birds are being lost at an alarming rate. In the absence of fire, even age silvicultural systems are the most appropriate way method of regenerating young forest habitats. However, acreage treated using even age silvicultural prescriptions in national forests in the east has declined by 52% since 1995. In the past 10 years, the Shawamigan Nicolay National Forest in northern Wisconsin, one of the most actively managed forests in the eastern region, has only met 28% of its forest plan goals for aspen forest type. 
out of 100 percent is failure in any test I've ever taken and I think it's a failure here too. And we are currently behind over 17,000 acres in the forest plan uh, of Aspen forest communities. No species can tolerate this 72 percent drop in habitat. It really only through a balanced approach to forest stewardship an approach that recognizes the ecological necessity of periodic disturbance, today impacted in primarily through commercial forest management, can the needs of our forest wildlife resources be adequately addressed? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Zimmer. Uh, we'll now uh, proceed with uh, five minutes of questioning, and I'll take the first uh, five minutes. Uh, Mr. Hoover, you mentioned in your testimony that additional research in identifying suitable natural enemies, uh, uh, pheromones, and biological controls for the emerald ash borer is greatly needed. Uh, has there been any success on these fronts? And also, what successes are there been with other invasive species that you can recount? Well, to effectively manage uh, forest pests, uh, we really don't have the tools in the way of chemical materials. So what needs to be relied on and what has been effective are those successes where parasitoids and predators have been released targeting the gypsy moth. Uh, there is a rearing facility, USDA facility in Brighton, Michigan, that is rearing uh, three parasitoids, two larval parasitoids, and one egg parasitoid of the emerald ash borer. In Pennsylvania just last year there were three release sites made of those natural enemies of the emerald ash borer. In 2012 their successful establishment and evaluation will be taking place. Uh, I, I believe Mr. Chairman that the long-range effective management of many of these invasive pests in our forests is hinged to establishing effective natural enemies to keep their populations at tolerable levels. Yeah, thank you. In your experience, has there been a, a positive research? Research obviously is incredibly important in this area in terms of uh, you know uh, in our previous discussion. You know the invasive species could change the entire characteristic of a forest, uh, having all kinds of ramifications. Um, has there been a positive research partnership between institutions of higher education, private organizations, industry, state governments, and federal government in particular? Uh, what's the collaboration been that you've seen with the U.S. Forest Service on invasive species, both in terms of prevention and suppression? It's been my experience in Pennsylvania. Uh, we formed, instead of having task forces that addressed each individual invasive pest, uh, those have all been consolidated into a forest pest council that's made up of state and federal governmental agencies, which includes the Forest Service out of their Morgantown office. Uh, my experience has been that collaboration between state uh, and academia with the Forest Service has been very good in the way of uh, human resources, uh, in the way of experimental materials that need to be evaluated on a statewide basis. So it's been my experience that the Forest Service role in research regarding invasives has been what you would want in the way of an interaction that benefits uh, state governments and, and our national forests as well as state and private forests. The, um, with some of the endangered, the, the, the method of transport, um, uh, it appears to be where it's carried in. You know, uh, another situation in California where logs were imported, and and now there's a significant uh, uh, outbreak of a specific invasive species. I know in in, in my own uh, national forest, uh, we see there's signs about you know use the firewood that you find, don't carry wood in and out. Uh, how much? And I know with your role with the uh, agriculture extension, how, how, how important is education in terms of preventing invasive species from being inadvertently introduced into an area? Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I uh, 
from a frustrated former biology teacher, uh, I regret to say we have a scientific illiterate society. And what Cooperative Extension's role is, is to try to educate the public as to the impact of unintentional movement of firewood that's infested with invasive wood boring insects. And so, uh, again, in collaboration with funding that supports publications, uh, USDA Forest Service, uh, along with regulatory agencies, uh, have been trying to make inroads along with Penn State Cooperative Extension, in, in the case of Pennsylvania, uh, trying to uh, provide out, outreach programming. I can give you one specific example where I provided some training to our county extension office. One of the people present there was a blogger, and they put the information on Emerald Ash Borer up on their blog, and lo and behold, someone saw it and said, I think I have that in my backyard. And as it turns out, the regulatory agencies went there, and indeed, they had emerald ash borer about 30 miles south of State College in Lewistown, Pennsylvania. Okay. Thank you. Uh, right, Mr. Ribble for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Barr, thank you for taking the long trip from Oregon all the way to uh, Washington, D.C. You had quite a, quite a uh, distance to come. You know, I could. I think we could transplant you into northern Wisconsin, and you would feel right at home based on your testimony. We could probably transplant you to Pennsylvania or to Florida, and you'd feel right at home. Do you believe this is a national problem, the description that you uh, made of your county? Absolutely. Just listening to some of the comments made by the subcommittee members, uh, it certainly resonated with everything that we deal with on a daily basis. I'd like you to. I'd like to invite you to some time to come to Northern Wisconsin. I think you'd find it beautiful, and uh, our lakes and streams are something else. Uh, uh, Representative Schrader, Representative Wallen, who you mentioned in your testimony, and I have spoken often about the issues in your forest and ours, and uh, they compare very favorably or unfavorably, depending on your perspective. Mr. Zimmer, thank you for coming from northern Wisconsin. Uh, I know that you've been a lifelong resident up there, and you've really dedicated pretty much your entire professional life from your college days all the way to today. Uh, and I would almost describe you as an environmentalist. You care about our national forests. You care about the habitat. You care about the wildlife. And yet, when I hear from the national environmental movement, and, and they contact me, uh, they would paint somebody like Mr. Watkins as a person who wants to rape and pillage for profit. What is, having lived in northern Wisconsin, having managed those forests, uh, seen the current uh, Shawamig and Nicolay Forest under the National Forest Service Management, and also seen private land management. Um, what what recommendations would you have for Congress and for uh, the Forest Service to better achieve their forest forest management goals? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, appreciate you introducing me also today. I think three things that really stick out in my mind. One is better accountability, and I think. The accountability has to come down to the forest supervisor and regional forester levels at least, that they're, they're better held accountable to plan goals and targets rather than just funded. I, 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 we recently got the uh, monitoring plan from the, the uh, Schwamgen Nicolay. It's taken a long time to put together, but they came out and they constantly sit in there, we achieved our funded targets. That isn't doing the job on the ground. I did hear uh, Chief Tidwell mentioned earlier about wildlife habitat goals in, here in the new planning regs, and, and I hope those goals are carried down and something the forest supervisors have to hold on to. And also things like making jobs or retaining jobs in the community should be a targeted goal, not just those funded things that come down. I think also these forests need better flexibility. You mentioned clearly in your statement earlier the forest in Schwamgen Nicolay now has over 300 million board feet available that's through the NEPA process, but hasn't increased their cell at hardly at all. They have plenty of people in the NEPA in the planning shop. Let's shift that shop now as any industry, as these gentlemen, this gentleman over here, would, or this gentleman, would shift his industry to make it more to get things done out there. And by doing that, we can shift. You may not have to cost you a dollar more, but we can shift the needs to implementers instead of planners now. And even stop 
need for any more NEPA for about two or three years on that forest. How would you, um, how would you advise us? Um, how would you advise the, the, the nation's environmental movement that seems to have similar goals? I mean, you know, they want robust forests, they want habitat, they, they want, where's the disconnect happening? Is it that they don't have the science or there's a disagreement on science? What, what's the, what is the problem here? Why, why can't you all get along? <laughs> that's, a, that's a million dollar question, I think. Um, I think it's, it's some want it all, and I think that's a big part of it. Uh, when the Forest Service did the uh, last planning process that took nearly eight years on the Schwamig and Nicolay, they tried their darndest to work closely with these environmental groups, especially the group in Madison, which has been the constant appeals and litiga litigants to the plan. And, um, and they tried their darndest, but, but, and the result was 40% of the forest was off limits to any type of active forest management. In my thinking, if I got even 40% in my ballpark, I'd be kind of happy. Hmm. Instead, they weren't. They wanted more. So they want it all. They want to actually shut down commercial forests, thinking that that's a bad thing. And in my mind, from a wildlife habitat standpoint, at least have some young forest, have some old forest, and have all those stages in between. And to have that end of the spectrum that meets the needs of young forest, we definitely have to have forest management and the use of commercial timber harvest. I, I understand it. I think those that live in your district understand it, but there's a few folks or a few organizations that don't understand that yet. Mr. Chairman, would you yield an additional three minutes? Thank you. Um, going along the, the line, since you've had so much experience in the National Forest Service yourself, the next round of uh, forest plan revisions are coming up on the horizon. Um, Right now, as you're in your role as a Ruffalo Grouse Society, um, how active do you and your members plan on being in that? Will you will you participate in the hearings, and and what role does your organization play in that? It's hard to justify to my boss that uh, while we spent eight years in discussions to get the last plan through, the result was a significant reduction in the target goals of uh, about a third uh, reduction in the targeted goals for Aspen management, which was key to our group. Um, it, it also um, resulted in about 40% uh, of the forest close to harvest and only, and now even though we did all that work and cooperated with the forest in the management plan um, discussions, we're only getting 28% of, of our Aspen targets at this current time. Putting all that all together, my boss is not too happy of me devoting a lot more time to that. And I think one other thing I can say is, for years, groups, conservation organizations, and industry, state, uh, uh, state uh, Department of Natural Resources, and others have been close partners with the National Forests. I think a lot of those partners have been forgotten or lost. And in our part of the world, as you know, you want to stick with your friends because they're always, they should always be there for you. It's tough to be a partner and a friend right now yeah. of this agency. I was, uh, I was with a constituent not too long ago, and uh, he asked me, he said, Congressman, do you trust me? And I said, well, sure, I trust you. He said, then give me your wallet. And so I reached my pocket, and I gave him my wallet. He pulled, proceeded to pull out a Sharpie, and he wrote on my wallet, and it says, develop a sense, sense of urgency. You hear that, Mr. Southern? develop a sense of urgency. This is a constituent and wrote it on my wallet. So every time I open it every single day, do you think our Forest Service needs a sense of urgency? Yes. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I recognize uh, my good friend from Florida, Mr. Sutherland, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I, uh, I did not know that was on the inside of his wallet when I made my comments a few moments ago. But, um, but um, thank you all very much for uh, for coming. And, and I found some. Of you, I found your testimony uh, fascinating and very helpful. And uh, uh, I commend the chairman uh, for for this panel and this hearing today. Um, you know, Mr. Um, Mr. Zimmer, you you made some. You know, much of your comments were regarding culture. And, and, and so much of the, of the time we spend as members, uh, we talk about at hearings symptoms. And we appropriate money towards symptoms, but we never get to the core 
of what the problem is. And I found your comments fascinating because you, you were very honest today in, 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 in your tenure and your retirement and, 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 and that uh, you left an organization that, uh, uh, that you felt was time to leave. And, but so much of the challenges that I hear you state really deal with a culture uh, that uh, really needs a controlled burn to go all the way through it. You know, down in North Florida, we got control burns down pretty well. Uh, we have great organizations like uh, Tall Timbers that are doing some incredible research to maintain a sustainable forest where humans and, and the environment can get along. Uh, I would uh, I'll throw out a, a congratulatory uh, 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 thanks to what they do. But, it, it, you know, you, you talked about 28% that in any test you've ever taken, that, that represents failure. Well, you 28% here in this culture, and you get an attaboy, and you get more dollars appropriated. That's nuts. So uh, I, I can I can see why you wanted to uh, to exit, um, and the sense of urgency that my colleague mentioned uh, it is it is um, it is clearly something that 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 we do not see, um, and and is that uh, uh, I don't want to that's really a, just a statement as I as I listen to your uh, to your honest uh, testimony today, and thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hoover. You, you know you you made uh, some some fascinating statements, and I enjoyed reading through your your testimony, uh, educating me uh, on uh, some of the issues that you find that are that are that are that are very very disturbing. Um, what would a private landowner do? by comparison to what the federal government is currently doing uh, regarding invasive pests, uh, or, or, and is there anything they could do or should do? You know, what does success look like? And, uh, but, but really, is there, is there a, a good way that maybe a private landowner could and should do and compared to what the government is doing regarding invasive pests? I'll uh, assume, Congressman Sutherland, that when you said private, uh, you mean a private forest landowner yes. or a residential situation? Yes. Because as I said, there are complete uh, different strategies and tools that exist between a landscape and a forest. Sure, but I mean, I know that we have, we have individual landowners uh, that own sizable um, uh, investments. Uh, and and they uh, they believe in in aggressive forest management plans. What would what would and there may be nothing different, I guess. But 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 what would they? Is there something different that uh, someone who didn't have to deal with the culture that would say, you know what? There's a need. We're going to meet it today. Get it done. Yeah, and that, and I think you're absolutely correct. That's that's what a private landowner has in the way of abilities to use. Uh, in any state, uh, based on your question, uh, the extension system that's associated with every land grant institution, where uh, in Pennsylvania, as an example, we've got extension foresters who would go out and help a landowner write a management plan for their forest land based on what their personal goals are. And, and those goals may be, you know, growing two by fours. Right. Habitat for wildlife or, or aesthetics. And so I think uh, to compare uh, federal forest land management, I think a private landowner, uh, if they are indeed informed, has the ability or maybe more accurately the flexibility to bring about management or effective management when compared to some of the restrictions that are put on federal landowners or the management of federal lands. Very good, very good. I um, I know. Are we going to have another round, or could I have just a? Okay. Um, the um, oh, thank you very much. You know, you mentioned earlier. You know, it's hard right now to be a partner and a friend. Uh, and I and I think you know I would say that that uh, uh, to the service, and, and 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 I would say oftentimes you have to start. If you're going to have a partner, you're going to have a friend. You have to start with a, a mutually agreed upon goal. What is the purpose? of our friendship, of our partnership. And um, unfortunately, I think that we enter into efforts assuming that we all have the same common goal. And so what happens is, is 
and we don't, which is apparent. Uh, because if you if you cared about these rural schools, if you cared about these rural communities, then then you certainly would act in a more uh, concerted effort uh, to uh, to in, in, increase the harvest rates in a management plan. You would sit down and work together. Uh, and that brings me to my next point. I know that uh, Chuck Watkins, uh, again, thank you for being here. You know, uh, one of your, uh, uh, one of the owners uh, of, of the family uh, was here last year. Caroline was here to testify. And uh, she made some statements regarding uh, some, um, some, some things that I found interesting as I look back over her testimony. She claimed that, uh, that there were some things that, that some solutions that could be pushed forward. And I'm interested in the FFRC's uh, position on some of the things that she mentioned. She mentioned that, for example, you know, one of the things that could be done is streamlining environmental documentation and outsourcing field work uh, would get, you know, foresters out of the office and into the field. That was one thing. Number two, including a resource advisory committee. Now, we, we mentioned the word partnership, you know, and, and to have a resource committee where you had participants, you know, from and stakeholders that work together on a, on a management plan, since it is the people's forests, and the taxpayers' forests, that's a novel idea. Uh, and then lastly, uh, that um, uh, we, we should require uh, selected national forests to test the feasibility of timber program self-financing uh, as is now done in DOD land. But uh, those were some of the things that I know we heard from last year. What does the, the coalition think of some of these ideas uh, in order to really get us where we need to be in a management plan? Well, the you know the first topic you mentioned was were the NEPA rules and the cost of those rules. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, <laughs> if you think uh, of of uh, a forest and trying to manage the forest um, efficiently, and and when I mean efficiently, I mean economically. You, if you put a lot of effort, uh, there there are some instances in this uh, in, in certain forests in this country where we do. Uh, we spend millions of dollars on administration and a, and a NEPA process to just decide we're not going to cut, um, that we're not going to cut that timber, we're not going to harvest that timber, or to just cut a lot less of it. Um, in some instances, 70% of the value is spent on administration or NEPA rules. We spend more on NEPA and those rules than we do uh, management of the forest, on, on, on state forestry, on education. Um, what we, what, you know, the big thing we prefer is that we, we, we put, we take a plan together. So for example, the Apalachicola forest, we put a 10 year plan together. We do our documentation, our NEPA rules on that and follow the plan. Streamlined, efficient, it's an economy of scale like any good business would do or perform. Hmm. That, that's uh, so in that process that's that's where we stand well I think that uh, there is a difference uh, in a business owner who's sweating a payroll and 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 working as hard as they can I've often said that our family loves 40-hour work weeks that's why we squeeze two into every seven-day period um, and and uh, you know we have we understand the difference between activity and productivity yes it sounds like the culture that is inside of many of the agencies and departments of the federal government. They're, they're interested in activity, but they do not know what true, positive, healthy productivity really looks like. And so I would say before spinning your wheels and in, in working in a partnership, and, I, and I, I think I commend you for wanting that partnership, we have to have a clear, concise goal why do we exist? What is our purpose? Don't spend your wheels. Don't allow a federal bureaucracy to, to, to eat up your time, your resources, without that definition. Why do we exist? And what does success look like? I thank you all for caring and coming here uh, to, uh, to, to educate us, and we need that. Uh, and I commend you. Uh, we want to be partners with you uh, to do what is right for our rural, our rural communities uh, and for healthy forests. And, and again, Mr. Chairman, I just commend you on, on uh, the, uh, the hearing today. Thank you. I yield back.
Thank the gentleman. Um, we will take the opportunity for another uh, round of questions. Mr. Barth, I want to start with you. You discuss your work with uh, stewardship contracting. Um, in addition to seeing a 25% share of revenue go to loyal localities, what other changes would you like to see to the program? Well, I think some of the concerns with the stewardship contracting and the, the value is that the revenues re stay on the land. Um, I think the challenge is, though, that none of the revenue is shared again with the uh, with the locals. And I don't necessarily know that that is a sustainable long term strategy as well. Um, I think we're even starting to hear from some of our stewardship alliances that if we don't have more productive force economically, we won't have long term revenue for stewardship. Right now, we've got a very successful dump stoppers program that we consider part of our stewardship as well. It's uh, partners with private and uh, federal landowners to clear up illegal dump sites throughout all of our um, wilderness and forested areas. We use our funding from our timber harvest program to match grant funding uh, from the agencies. Both of our funding streams are at risk now um, because of the secure rural schools payment issues as well as kind of the lack in productivity in the harvest. So I think it kind of goes hand in glove. I think we need to have productive, healthy, sustainable forests that regenerate in order to produce the revenue for us to do the conservation and the stewardship efforts on the preservation lands. Thank you. Mr. Zimmer, um, how important is forest diversity? Um, and that's what you were describing in one of your last responses, having force in many different stages of development is um, and really only evident to me through proper management to, to have that, that forest diversity. How important that is, is that to wildlife habitat? But to get the full array of wildlife species, some require very old forests, some require very young forests, and, and some require those in between or those that replace them. And in, in our instance, when we're talking about those, those all of the range of species that utilize young forest habitat, that includes uh, uh, over half of the neotropical migratory birds in, in our part of the world. Uh, I think there's 187 listed in the Midwest, uh, neotropical migratory birds, and at least half of them use young forest habitats at least some time during the breeding season, often to hide their young and to feed their young, even if they're in older habitats. You need kind of a mosaic, you need different sizes, you need the whole ball of wax out there to get to, to really truly need, meet the needs of, of all of the wildlife species, at least all of the native wildlife, wildlife species found on our forests. If you just concentrate on going to one extreme, and, and that is done artificially in a sense when, when we're restricting harvest and restricting disturbance to our forest, uh, we do that with our fire suppression efforts, especially in the eastern part of the country. So it comes down to if we're going to think about those species that need that younger end of the spectrum, we're going to have to use this forest management. At the same time, we have to look at the older, the species that utilize older forests and older, older forest communities. Um, and so, so a, a nice mix of species and habitat, or a nice mix of habitats and types of forests out there is essential to have the full range of forest uh, wildlife species. And I would also, in your opinion, that be consistent with good, healthy, uh, correct production of timber. And, and commercial forest management is a key, key component of that. It's a key tool. Ms. Watkins, why do you believe that we are not harvesting as much on national forests as each plan generally calls for? Uh, Mr. Thompson, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Uh, the, uh, in your in your time in Northwest Florida, would you say the the overall trend has been in uh, what is what has been the overall trend in terms of the health of national forests? Any observations on that? Uh, what the the forest, like I said, we we are cutting uh, a very small amount of the growth. The mortality rate is six times the the cut rate, as you mentioned in, in Oregon as well. Um, I believe they're actively managing the health of the forest. However, the when the densities increase to that level, it it's uh, there there's certain habitat there that it affects. Um, it certainly um, creates issues with fire um, protection and control 
and insect and disease control. So it's that, that density has increased uh, over 30 percent and that creates problems particularly when the Forest Service tries to control burn or the understory of the of the forest makes it makes it extremely difficult. Thank you. Now recognize Mr. Schrader for five minutes. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for having to step out for, for a little bit. Um, Mr. Zimmer, uh, actually appreciate your comments. As you know, Oregon, uh, through this uh, uh, ONC uh, National Forest Service plan, we're trying to develop as a delegation, trying to look at the Searle stage, which seems to be lacking in our state, so we get that continuum of biodiversity to make it uh, conducive to the, the plan of play of species that are out there. Uh, your, I just, if you can, real quick, your comment on, uh, we have a spotted owl issue out, out where we come from, and so a few years back, uh, we set aside uh, large swaths of old growth forests, which seem to be their preferred habitat. Uh, recent data has come in and uh, uh, Fish and Wildlife has concluded that that hasn't helped at all. And indeed, uh, the species is on an accelerated decline. The answer uh, to that was to set aside more old growth forests. That doesn't sound smart to me. There's also apparently a, another species of barred owl that is uh, being a predator on the spotted owl, at least on their habitats. Why are we setting aside, does it make sense to you to set aside vast amounts of, of forest when we already concluded through the study that the increased forest land old growth wasn't really the answer at the end of the day? I'm not saying we shouldn't have old growth forest, don't get me wrong, but to increase it even more when that didn't work in the first place, your comment. Yes, uh, Congressman. Uh, one thing, I am not a spotted owl expert, Fair enough. but I do. I am aware of the uh, the influence of the barred owl on the spotted owl, and it, it appears, at least at this time, to be more of a factor in that in that uh, uh, the limitations on the, the populations of the spotted owl. Um, it's it's going to be tough to. Um, to justify having more, as you say, having more acreage for, of old growth for spotted owl. I would hope that, that when we're looking in, and those that are looking at the forest plans in your area, address that and look at the whole community and, 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 and the whole uh, value of those forests and, and those that play an important role for spotted owl and spotted owl management be maintained. But if, if, yeah. if it's not needed, or isn't doing the job, uh, that decision has to be made well, by all. I appreciate your common sense approach. Hopefully uh, people will get religion in Oregon and, and adopt some of what you're, you're suggesting here. Um, Mr. Watkins, you uh, listed in your, uh, maybe I, this was asked, but in your prepared testimony for recommendations that you thought would be pretty helpful, uh, you know, in terms of reducing costs and getting better results. Uh, is the National Forest Service implementing them? Not, not that I'm aware of. Okay, which speaks volumes. Particular. Okay, um, I guess last I just uh, uh, make a comment uh, on Mr. Barth's uh, testimony, which I appreciate. I think it's maybe just reiterate uh, what he talked about on less than 3,000 acres, uh, their annual revenue goal, which they seem to get is about $750,000. Uh, and on our neighboring Mount Hood forest uh, of 1.1 million acres, basically 300 times uh, the size of acreage that uh, Mr. Barth and uh, my county manage, they get one third of the revenue he gets, about $275,000. I think that's a dramatic statement, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Now, I uh, yield to my friend from Wisconsin for an additional five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I'm going to come back to, uh, to Mr. Zimmer. Um, you know, since about 1970, there's been a kind of an ever increasing amount of federal involvement in our forests and in our environmental issues, uh, an ever-increasing regulatory burden, um, all with the intent of uh, actually improving things that the Ruffed Grouse Society would kind of support from my understanding. And the whole idea here was to, to make those habitats better. Uh, it, it's kind of the, the onslaught of regulations improve things or not. Uh, uh, regulations improve yeah. things? Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, 
I think I think really in co common sense is, is better. Let's use the specialists we have out there. The Forest Service on the Schwamming and Nicolay is blessed or has been blessed with. In fact, it's the envy of most of the state folks that they can go to one office and, and get specialists from all around professionals, trained professionals that could do the be best management of the job. The state folks often have to call others in from, from academia or, or find some specialist on a, in another state or something like that to help them with an issue. The Forest Service has those professionals. Why do we need more and more regulations to hinder the work of people that are paid and have the training to do the job? And, and I think that's where I, it, it, it makes sense to me to have to limit the regulations and have the people who are your employees, your, the tax, or our employees, the, the, the people the taxpayers hire to do the best job and, and limit the restrictions on those people to do that job. I, I worked with many of those folks, top quality people, many of them frustrated. At, at all the regulations that they have in place. I may say that uh, in the Schwamming and Nicolay National Forest Plan in 2004, um, I believe it's 368 standards and guidelines are in place to regulate the management of any action on the forest. It's, 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 it's endless. And, and the, the pages in each uh, document for a site-specific project that just shows how many other little things they have to cover is it, just way, way too much. Mr. Watkins, um, I'm assuming that in, <clears throat> in your line of work, you have, uh, you have to comply with the number of federal agencies on the regulatory standpoint. Um, what should we as members of Congress be doing uh, we want to make sure that we have clean air, clean water, force that actually work and produce. Um, but what role have regulations played uh, in your business, and what should we be looking at doing here? Well, for example, um, Mr. Zimmer mentioned the, the SFIR, that Sustainable Forestry Initiative. That's what we do. Our company is certified, um, which basically our regulations, by our certification, is more stringent than I understand the Forest Service own regulations are, and we don't have issues. We don't spend this, these volumes of dollars on administrative tasks where they seem to, to have to do that. Um, and, and I don't quite understand that. I, I would say streamline that process and, and eliminate that overburdening uh, the, the items that are just not necessary. Um, there are other private industries that use certification programs that that don't do that or don't cost or put that burden on on companies. Is, is there a I'm assuming there's a profit in, profit incentive for you to manage the force that you're involved in 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 a way that's sustainable? Is that correct? Oh, certainly. Yes. I mean, at the end of the day, then uh, maybe the objectives could could actually be met, couldn't they? That we could have a sustainable force that's environmentally sound and profitable and provides some benefit to the taxpayer. Absolutely. That's the perfect uh, way to do it. Very good. Thank you. And I yield back my time. Thank the gentleman for yielding back. And I want to thank the, uh, both the members and uh, the members of the panel, uh, the witnesses, for, for coming here, bringing your, your expertise um, and your uh, uh, specific individual expertise. I thought we had a uh, great diversity on this panel, uh, all focused on healthy forests and, in the end, our healthy rural communities. Uh, I appreciate your uh, everyone's patience. With uh, um, we took some liberties in terms of uh, the amount of questions that we did. Didn't adhere too well to the clock, but this is a pretty important topic that I don't think we've talked about near enough, and it deserves a tremendous amount of vetting. And uh, we certainly, uh, I think, did well today of bringing expertise. Uh, your expertise here to Washington to be able to to offer that to help us as we look at uh, future forest uh, policies. Uh, the uh, under the rules of the committee, uh, the record of today's hearing will remain open for 10 calendar days to receive additional material and supplementary written responses from the witnesses uh, to any questions posed by a member. Uh, this hearing of the subcommittee of conservation, energy, and forestry is adjourned. <laughs>